Let's turn our attention to what happened in the States over the weekend. We had 21 people die in the mass shooting in El Paso in Texas. 13 hours later, nine killed in Dayton, Ohio. Both of them uh, were carried out by young men, uh, both armed with uh, semi-automatic assault rifles. Now, Donald Trump yesterday, as you just heard, blamed mental illness uh, for the two mass shootings and the social media. People have played video games. Some people, even did, some Senate candidates, the Republicans, have actually uh, blamed the, the lack of people praying in the United States. Uh, however, there's been an awful lot of accusations that actually Donald Trump is more to blame for those shootings. He's stirred up racial tensions with his rhetoric ever since 2015, 2016, as he ran for the presidency and is doing it once again ahead of the 2020 elections as well. Everyone keeps citing the Second Amendment rights to bear arms, but there's no doubt at all. Assault weapons have been banned before. Mass shootings dropped under Bill Clinton as a result. When that ban expired, what a surprise, mass shootings went up. So what is the solution? Why is America alone being the only Western country where mass shootings take place and no action is done to take away those guns. Let's talk to Dr Brian Class about this. He's Assistant Professor of Global Politics at uh, University College London. He's also author of The Despot's Apprentice, uh, Donald Trump's Attack on Democracy. And he joins us now. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Now, you, of course, are an American, as people will guess from your accent, uh, but have lived uh, a long time here as an academic here in the UK. Um, we watch these scenes unfold, you know, turn on the TV over the weekend and think, oh, my God, another mass shooting. And then you can see that, yeah, the death toll is going to be hugely high. It's at Walmart. And then we see what happened just a few hours later in Ohio. Um, the reaction in places like the UK, when Dunblane, with Australia, their massacre, with New Zealand, with their massacre recently, is the moment these major massacres happen, we take away the guns. We make it harder for bad or mad people to get the guns. Why does the same scene play out again and again, week after week after week, year after year in America, and yet they don't take away the guns? What is different in the American psyche, in American politics, in the American people that means that doesn't happen? Brian Class, have we lost him? Brian, can you hear me? It was, and it was, and it was such a good question as well, wasn't it? <laughs> well, tell me while we get him back on the line. Let's go to my guest. Uh, oh, you know, I lie. He is back. Dr. Frank Lash, you're back on the line. Apologies for that. Yes, I am. Sorry about that. Right. I don't know what happened. Yes. Uh, so to answer your question, I mean, I think there's basically a few things that are happening. One is there's a cultural affinity towards guns um, in a way that doesn't exist in a lot of other countries. There's also uh, the NRA, which has been a major lobbying influence on even the most basic things get blocked in terms of reform. So. Universal background checks, for example, to make sure that everybody goes through a background check before they buy a gun. There are still some loopholes to that. And 90 percent of Republicans and 95 percent of Democrats favor changing that law and they can't get it passed. And that's partly because the NRA opposes it. But at this stage, I mean, the problem is out of control. One of the things that's different between the U.S. and every other developed country is just the rate of gun ownership. So there's an estimated 393 million guns in the United States owned by civilians for 330 million people. So 1.2 guns for every man, woman, child, and baby in the United States. Second place to that is Yemen, which has you know, less than half the rate of gun ownership. It has one gun for every two people in the country. And then you get to countries like the UK, where there's one gun for every 20 people, which is actually, you know, mostly hunting rifles, clay pigeons. Can, can I say that higher than I would have expected it to be? It is, but, but it's actually, you know, it's one of the things where the type of gun is very different. You might have collectors who have, say, 30, 40 guns, but they're all, you know, old-time rifles or they're extremely tightly controlled. There's, there's a series of steps you have to go through in order to buy a gun. You know, if you look at almost every developed country, there are between five and 15 steps before you buy a gun. These include things like mental health checks, background checks, uh, certifications from, you know, references from friends that say you're mentally fit to own a gun, all sorts of things. In the U.S., it's in most gun purchases, there's an instant background check with a flawed database and then you're handed the gun. Right? And, and of course, I mean, the irony being in America that the first shooting that lost, we saw the loss of life of 21 people was in a Walmart, for goodness sake, where they openly sell guns. And where you can openly carry guns. In, in Walmarts in Texas, there's an open carry law. So if you want to walk in with your AK-47 semi-automatic style assault rifle and just walk the aisles with it, there's no law against that. It's totally legal. <laughs> It's, it's, it's um, absolutely you know, the, the, bizarre, isn't it? But, but, but Bill yeah. Clinton did ban assault weapons in 1994. He was able to get that through. Mass shootings dropped by 43%. And then, this is the bit I don't understand, the ban was allowed to expire 
uh, 10 years later under George Bush. And what a surprise, mass shootings went up 230% in the following years. Uh, did, was that not enough of a signal to the American people and the American policymakers and politicians that, that maybe the access to guns... I mean, we're always going to have some crazy people. We're always going to have some bad people. The point is, when they do go on the rampage, how many people realistically can they kill when they do that? Yeah, and this is the argument that's often trotted out by pro-gun advocates in the United States, is that the only thing that can stop a, good, a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. It's an NRA talking point. But both in Dayton, Ohio, and in the shooting last week that we've already forgotten about at the Garlic Festival in California. Yeah, good point. Yeah. People, both of those instances, the shooter was killed within one minute, literally one minute of opening fire, and they still killed 15 people between the two of them. And that's partly because in Dayton, Ohio, the guy had what's called a drum magazine, which is a double drum magazine, which has 100 rounds of ammunition in the, in the magazine. So he can fire 100 bullets in less than a minute without reloading. And it's completely legal. And he purchased his gun online. So, I mean, the, the, the various aspects of this, even the low-hanging fruit of solving the problem, haven't been attempted. It was an attempt by Democrats to ban people on the no-fly list because they're suspected of being terrorists, of not owning guns, and that was blocked. So, you know, I mean, there has been no le legislation that has been passed to address this problem for almost a generation. I mean, 25 years, basically, since we've had any real movement on gun legislation. And, you know, I don't I'm not terribly optimistic that even these killings will do anything, because when Sandy Hook happened, yeah. which is the killing of all the elementary school kids, if that doesn't move the needle, I, I don't know. That was, that was a game changer for me, I have to say. If, if, if people are going to accept that, yeah, for the, your right to hold, bear arms, that we're going to allow six-year-olds to be slaughtered in their classroom. At that point, that, it, to me, it was game over. But President Obama, and we all remember that vividly, that picture of him uh, in the video, and he was uh, uh, having to you know, make a speech and try and be more presidential than the current president, and he, and he started crying. And I think as any, as any normal person would actually but he tried to expand background checks for gun buyers a ban on assault weapons and high capacity magazines and it was blocked by republicans in the senate now given that the majority of people in the united states do want these basic checks they might well believe that the right to bear arms but again you know your right to own a gun to protect your family or to have a shooting rifle but not a semi-automatic of all intents and purposes a battleground weapon in any in anyone most may same people's ideas if that's what they want you say the NRI, NRA, the National Rifle Association, they, they oppose this, um, and they've got big money. How does that work, though, in America? How do they manage to... Because it's not just that they, they only back people who, who are standing for, for political roles if they support them. Isn't it also that they, they bombard candidates who, who are against the NRA and who want gun control with negative advertising? And, and, and so even people who want... You, you, even if you don't want the NRA to have anything to do with you, they can still actually affect your campaign. Yeah, so they're very, very strategic at how they target campaigns during the primary process, and they're very effective at it. They're a big, you know, they're a big political force with their financing, but also in the early stages. So a great example of this is in Minnesota, where I'm from, there was a candidate who had an A rating from the NRA, the top rating you can get. He was a Democrat. And then he voted once to ban what are called cop killer bullets. They're bullets that expand on impact to go through body armor effectively. And they changed his rating from an A to an F on that single vote after decades of supporting gun rights and then tried to pour money into defeating him. And so even giving an inch is enough to turn the NRA against you. And that's why these Republicans are opposing even the most basic common sense legislation. And it's just it's, it's, it's you know, it's baffling because most people look at this problem and there are fixes. And I think the thing that most people also agree on is what is the alternative? Doing nothing. I mean, doing nothing is not working. So at least we could try something and hope that we could reduce some deaths, even if it's not going to solve the problem completely. Just finally, in one word, do you think uh, that Donald Trump under his presidency now or possibly if he gets re-elected, as many fear he will in 2020, some, of course, hoping he will, um, do you think that he's going to take any action in his presidency? No. I mean, he's had multiple opportunities and he actually said that he would not back background checks uh, in okay. February. So. It's just absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? I think the rest of the world is just shaking its head in utter bewilderment.